I know you guys are probably sick of hearing it, but I am sorry. I really was planning on getting this video out a lot earlier than now. Uh, even if I hadn't finished playing the game, I was having RL problems in general. In fact, uh, well, let's just say I'm a little bit behind on my videos, as I've already mentioned, at some point in time, which at this point was like several days ago. I'm not even sure where the actual video uploads are compared to when I recorded them, but anyways, point being, I do apologize. Now, first and foremost thing, as usual, no spoilers, no spoilers, no spoilers. No spoilers in the comments, same rule as, as it has been, uh, especially about this one. I will be, as usual, trying to do my whole little, you know, point of no return thing, and then from that point on I'll start discussing spoileriness. But until then, whoops. Dang it, there we go. Now this is Assassin's Creed Revelations. Let me do, do uh, toss out one other thing here really quick. One of the things I've always endeavored to do is to be honest with you guys. To just be like, hey, it's me, and as much as I don't like uh, certain altercations, the fact of the matter is I don't like being dishonest any more than that. So, I, I mentioned this here, this will, this will come up in the Kingdom Hearts series as well. My opinion is probably not going to be very popular, and I can live with that. But I am still going to be honest about it. I mean, I was honest about Dragon Age 2, for example, and my opinions about Mass Effect 1 and 2, so I, I see no reason to stop here. I am going to try to justify my arguments and give my reasonings at the very least so that you can understand where I'm coming from. So even if we disagree, you could at least you know see that I'm not just saying I disagree or whatever. And in case I haven't given it all away already, yes, I personally think this is the best of the series, in my opinion. I mean that sincerely. I think Assassin's Creed Revelations is the best of the Creed series to date. I'm keeping in mind I haven't played three, but from what I understand, and I have heard several different viewpoints, all of which have basically told me the exact same thing about three, three is not going to pass Rev in my book. Take it or leave it. Now, let's start, start talking about why. Now, where's my lines? I've actually got quite a few notes about this one. Good lord. Okay. There's a couple things I'm going to discuss here that have to do with the series as a whole, partially because I feel it's most relevant here, but also because this is kind of an end of a series video at the same time as, you know, just about this game, so just letting you know. One of the things I do definitely think was a very good uh, decision for this was the introduction of John Delancey. For those of you who are not aware who that is, that is a voice actor in this case. He plays uh, William, and he you hear him at several points throughout the game, and you actually do see him towards the end of the game. And he's awesome. <laughs> Enough said. Those of you who don't actually recognize him, he plays Q over on Star Trek Next Generation. But make no mistake, that is not the only reason I like John Delancey. He is, in my opinion, a good actor. And he has a certain way of using his voice, uh, which makes him very good at voice acting. And every time I see something he's in, I tend to at least look at it, because it merits some attention. And he was a definite add additive to this. There was a great deal of subtlety in his tone and in his uh, the way he presented his, his wording and certain subjects. I can't talk about all of those right now, because we're in the known spoiler section, but you get the general point. Now, one other thing I really like was the whole... How do I put this? Um, I can say this without any real spoilers. The premise of the beginning of Revelations is Desmond, our viewpoint character, for, has had a bit of a mental breakdown, and he is now in the Animus trying to recover from that fact, okay? And he's like, oh god, you know, and, and the, one of the things that the game really does very well is actually visually demonstrate this. Uh, nowhere more than the Desmond sections, which uh, I want to cover at least in brief here. The Desmond sections... Well, okay. Each Assassin's Creed game has added something new as far as either mechanics or something to do, mini-games, that kind of thing. You know, it, it, the house building in 2, the, the uh, city renovations in Brotherhood and recruiting in Brotherhood. Now we have these little Desmond sections. I'm sure there's a proper name for them. I don't remember it off the top of my head. What it is, and this is important for two very good reasons, is you go through these puzzle, these jumping puzzles, these first-person jumping puzzles. And those of you who have seen the series at all know that that's a bit of a difference by itself. And actually jump around and engage in these separate puzzles, which are a completely different format. And I really like the fact that it is effectively, for all intents and purposes, a completely separate game. Uh, much shorter, of course, much less involved, but it's still there. I don't know how many of you have played the PC version of Revelations, but to get across the point that this is a completely different engine, it is actually a different executable. It actually shuts down Revelations and opens up the other executable with, with the save file data say, uh, carried over so that you can play this completely new engine in this first-person physics puzzle game thing. It's kind of hard to describe, to be honest with you. 
you know, you can you jump, you have to avoid beams, and, and certain beams will destroy the blocks that you can create in order to jump over. It, it is, like I said, kind of hard to describe. But I think what I like most about it is it, ex is it is a severe example of gameplay and story integration. As I said, Desmond had a bit of a mental breakdown, and the his, uh, going through these sections is, for us, learning about Desmond Miles. I'll talk about specifics later after the non-spoilers point, but that's the premise, right? This is Desmond recovering some of who he is, remembering who he is, and as a result, we, the audience, get to see who he is. So that's a good, uh, a good way of getting it to us, first of all. When you have a character that you introduce uh, midway or towards the end of their story, you have to m figure out a method to get their history back uh, to you. Some people do it piecemeal, some people do it through flashbacks. Uh, this was an excellent way to do that, I, I thought. It, again, gameplay story integration. And one of the things I like best about it is as you're going through this place, it is extremely fragmented. The, all these puzzles are actually literally fragmented. Like you'll go up towards a thing which which is literally just a bunch of pix uh, shards of light, like someone had shattered the glass. But as you get closer, they, they form out and you actually realize that that is a picture that, that you know, actually comes cohesive as soon as you get in range of it. It was very indicative of the mental state that Desmond is in at the time, and it was a really get, great way to visually, without ever saying anything, get that point across to the player. One of the other things I like about this section is the... Uh, the fact that we learn about Desmond Miles. Again, I don't want to talk about that extensively, but I have said before, in my opinion, Desmond Miles isn't really a, a main character in the series until this game. He does come a little bit more into the foreplay, uh, basically inch by inch as the series goes on, but Revelations is the first time that we actually learn about Desmond Miles. Who is Desmond Miles? Why is Desmond Miles? This is the first time we really get some real background and real info on who he is and whatnot, and so he actually becomes a character rather than just a viewpoint. Y you understand me? And so I really like the fact that they did that through these little sections. And they are, of course, optional, so you don't have to do them if you don't want to. Again, I like that. I also uh, want to give them applause for the fact... I already mentioned this in, in brief, you know, it is so different from the rest of the game. That is a very good thing if done well, and in my opinion they did in this case. And the reason that is, uh, the reason I think that it's a good thing if done well, is the concept of uh, the anti-boredom principle, is basically what it is. The basic idea here is if, let's play you're saying, let's say you're playing a first-person shooter. Now let's say you're just gung ho, you know, Ramboing, you know, like you're playing Doom again, or or the original Duke Nukem, you know, just yeah, not the original, original, the side scroller, you know what I mean? Yeah, just going through, and then all of a sudden you shift completely to a thing where you have to be very careful and very stealthy, and one shot will kill you. Now that's the kind of thing that even though it's using the same engine, even though it's still an FPS, the rules have changed. You understand? And that, uh, if done properly, can add an excellent flow, and more importantly, make sure you don't get bored. Make sure you're 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 constantly if you're constantly switching back and forth like that, or not even constantly, but every now and again. In my case, I actually went back every uh, memory sequence uh, until I finished all the Desmond sequences because uh, I figured that was a good flow and it ended up working very well for me. I did that this time around. Last time I just kind of got everything and did it all in one bunch. I didn't like that as much. Point being that it's a good way to break things up, you know. And again, it's optional, but if you're actually enjoying it, fantastic. Uh, nothing but good things to say about that one. And, and just to add to it, towards the very end of it, uh, one of the things that is even more awesome is you start to actually see... You know, it, this whole thing is like in a... I, I hate to call it the Matrix, but, you know, it's it's very clearly a computer program. There's nothing here that looks even remotely realistic. But as you go through, it gets more and more realistic. You start to see, you know, certain things in certain areas, and finally it gets to the end where it actually looks like a building, like you're actually going through an area, a place that physically exists because your memories are starting to cohese and starting to get, you know, and you're actually starting to figure out who you are. Excellently done. Um, I do like the basic premise of the game. I already mentioned that. Desmond is having mental issues and he's basically in a coma in the, in the Animus. Now, the reason I like that is because... Actually, you know what? I'm gonna leave that one. I'm gonna leave that one for the post... Uh, for the post-spoilers section. Uh, I do apologize. I could discuss that, but it would be very brief without getting into spoilers, so let's move on. Love the different set pieces in this game. Um, now, let me try and explain it. This is going to be a bit of a lengthy thing. Lengthy discussion. Brotherhood gave us Roma, and it was massive, and there was lots of countryside, and lots of roaming, and lots of city, and lots of stuff, right? Assassin's Creed 2 gave us lots of different zones. Assassin's Creed 1 gave us lots of different zones that were kind of similar. Revelations give us gives us Constantinople, okay? Or Istanbul, if you prefer. 
Um, the city is... God, I don't even know where to start. I actually have quite a few things to say just about the city of Constantinople. First of all, the city is much smaller than any other Assassin's Creed ga game has been to date. Uh, it it's fairly small, and it's just the one area. As weird as this is going to sound, I think that is a good thing. And l allow me to try and explain why. In Brotherhood, one of the biggest problems I had was after a while, after I had done all the missions and then all did all the mission uh, mission types, all the different kind of mini games, all the different kind of recruitments, all the different kind of you know ways to get money and and purchasing renovations, it got a bit boring after the second or third repetition because there was it was so huge and there was so much of it, and they didn't vary Brotherhood as much as I think they could have or indeed should have. I'm not detracting per se, I'm just saying that the sheer immensity of the area kind of demands, from a gameplay perspective, s an increased amount of variety. Now that can be a good thing if you do increase the amount of variety, if you do have more to do. Um, to give you a bit of an example, this is kind of the Just Cause 2 syndrome. Now let's make this clear, I love Just Cause 2, that's an amazing game and I have a ton of fun with it. It's, it's like the second defining sandbox, in my opinion, sandbox game, but... Speaking honestly, speaking objectively, it doesn't really vary all that much. The missions do, but just the stuff to do that isn't missions? N not really. And so you have this gargantuan world that's tons of fun to explore and run around in, but once you get to the point where you're no longer having fun exploring and running around in, you put it down until you're in the mood for it again. At least that, that's what I do. This is my perspective again. But that's my point in a nutshell. Brotherhood had that same general problem. Constantinople is much smaller. I didn't. I never got bored in Assassin's Creed Revelations. I never got to the point where I was like, oh, I have to do this again. Not once. Every uh, mission I did was enjoyable. Every little se sequence I did was enjoyable. I had no pro... Because the place was so small and there was a freedom of movement, which I'll get into more in a second, I had no problem having stuff to do while I waited for money to collect in the bank for my city renovations. So there were never any periods of time where I just had to put the controller down, so to speak, and walk off and read a book while I waited for, you know money to gather up so I could go buy more. Didn't have that issue. Instead, I would, you know, go to the bank whenever a new thing would come in and be like, aha, money, take the money, and go spend it immediately on whatever happened to be nearby. I tend to be an organized sort, so I'd usually, you know, go immediately to the next bank or nearby, buy that, buy the near things. And then I would go off and find more animus data fragments, or I would get more towers, or I would free more areas from the Templars, you know, blah, blah, blah. And by the time I was done with... I shouldn't even say done. I, I was in the process of doing stuff when the money would tick over again. Then I'd pause what I was doing, go get the money, and then I'd go keep doing stuff after buying some more stuff. My point was, in Revelations, because of the smaller size and because of the pacing of it, there was never a pause point for me. Now, maybe that's because of how I play the game, as, and as I just kind of elaborated that in a nutshell. And that's, But I do think that is at least partially intentional, number one, and can be at least partially credited to the size of the city, as I just mentioned, and f very much credited to a third point, which I'm not going to get to. In Brotherhood, uh, if this is the whole area of Roma, within this region... Well, hang on. Within this region... Sorry, slipped into my accent there for a second. Uh, you can, like, in Memory Sequence 1, you can go here. And Memory Sequence 2, you can go here. And 3, you can go, like, here. And it just kind of expands after a while, right? Anybody who played Brotherhood knows what I'm talking about. You know, you get to a certain point, and it gets to the, the barrier of data, and it's like, you should not be here. And you actually desync if you're out there for more than a few seconds. In Revelations, you do the... the I shouldn't even say the tutorial. I was still doing the tutorial when it suddenly just kind of occurred to me, I can go anywhere in the city. And I remember that revelation, <laughs> no pun intended, uh, just being like, wow, I actually have the freedom to go do whatever. So, as you can probably imagine, the very first thing I did was went off and did for whatever, because I loved the fact that I was le let off the leash so soon into the game. I mean, I hadn't even gotten the ability to recruit guys yet. I finally decided, on the advice of a friend, uh, to go ahead and get to the point where I could recruit assassins and start building up my empire. Well, so that I could do be doing that while I was doing the renovations, while I was doing all the missions, while I was getting... And so it made this awesome, just, just giant chunk of like 20 hours of solid gameplay. No waiting, no pause, barely any even cutscenes. It was just gameplay, pure playing, you know what I mean? Now, that's funny because one of the things the Assassin's Creed series has always been touted for is its story... But I have to give Revelations credit for having that as an option. Of course, I didn't have to do that. I could have gone and com I could have completely ignored the side stuff. I could have gone and just done the main missions and then gotten up to the last point and then done all the optional stuff. You know, I, I could have done it in whatever order I want, but that's my point. 
the smaller city size, the the earlier speed of being free to do whatever. Uh, the only thing you can't do until like memory six, I guess, is go to the other town, and the other town is only relevant for those three books and a few fragments and stuff like that. You know, other than that, I was like, yes, I can go do whatever. I really enjoyed that fact. Um, one of the other things that I enjoy that has been made fun of a lot, and yet I actually think was a great decision, is the hook blade. Now, using it for the rope things, in all honesty, I only did that every now and again. It was fun every time I did, and it was great for assassinating roof guards. But that thing actually changed the flow of the parkour in this game. Uh, especially if you know what you're doing, and I'm sure any of you out there who've played this game uh, know exactly what I'm talking about. But put simply, uh, you 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 can jump up like to here, and then you can you you can either just keep going if there's enough handle holds to keep going, or if there's one way up there, you can go and then go keep going like that, right? With the hook blade, while it only increases your reach by about a foot, that foot basically means except for the huge gaps, there's nothing out of your reach anymore. So it's more like. It increased the speed and the flow of the overall movement so much that it was like rediscovering the parkour element of the game. Way back when I first picked up Assassin's Creed 1, you know, when I was first getting into the game, I loved it. I loved just running around the town and, oh, yeah, I get up and do this, and yeah. I enjoyed that element of it. But ever since then, it's been kind of a normal thing, all things considered. They added some options in 2, and in Brotherhood, I believe, but none of them were really... It really changed the formula. It wasn't until this time that it actually felt like, because before it's always felt like, you know, like like a wave thing. You know, you go and then what? You go. But in this one, with the thing, and and there's another element. You know, you have those potted plants you could hook on and go around, or you could just grab and go straight. You know, that option existed. And the uh, the overall point I'm trying to get across is that the addition of that one additional foot and the ability to do those double jumps for all intents and purposes. Which, if you're wondering what I mean, uh, you know, here's the wall. You could you know go up, grab with the hook, and then immediately jump and grab with the hook, and then immediately jump and grab with the hook. You could do that like three or four times in a row. I forget how many times. It might not actually be limited. I don't think there's any bear that has more than like three in a row. I'm thinking of that one tower whose name escapes me in like the northern section but anyways point remaining that small minute change in my opinion was a great idea I, I, I sincerely mean that um one of the other things I really enjoyed is the ad additive uh, the, as you I've always tend uh, ever since Assassin's Creed 2 I have always enjoyed the combat in the Assassin's Creed series revelations I had just such a ball with the combat now, I have been told uh, by several people that the combat is overall even better in 3 if you're good. Not going to comment on that here, I've just wanted to make a note of that. And it wouldn't surprise me because they do seem to be polishing it every successive game. But in Revelations, the most recent one I've played, it is the most polished I've ever seen it. It is awesome. The addition of the, uh, the, the leg sweep or the hook blade over the move, and the fact that you can uh, counterattack even the guys who don't get one shot and just... Uh, the different options you had, the poison gun, the uh, the bombs, oh, the bombs are awesome. The, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, and, and indeed, uh, you know, there may be several of you, the, you have this ability to craft bombs. Now, they made this big deal about all these options you can make. Ul now, there are certainly quite a bit of varieties, but ultimately it comes down to nine, for all intents and purposes. Well, uh, nine results and, like, three means of of making the result happen. Of, of delivery, that's the word I was thinking of. Three uh, various means of delivery. You know, you, you've got a bomb that will go off on impact. You've got a bomb that will roll and then go off. You've got the, something that will stick and then go off. And then you've got something where you could set out a tri tripwire, right? I guess that's four. If there's another one I don't know about off the top of my head because I didn't use it. And of course, you can have these be uh, blood packets. Now, for example, if you hit someone with a blood packet, they'll be like, oh my god, I'm bleeding, this is horrible. It's really funny to watch. Um, you can have it be uh, gold, fake golden coins, pyrite. So, you know, people are like, oh my god, money, you know. I'm not going to go through every single option, but there were so many of them that that added to your tactical capacity in any given case tenfold. And, and this is very important, while you can only carry so many bombs at you at a time of three types, there's like distraction, uh... I don't remember what, and um, distraction, deception, or something like that, you know, like putting up a smoke cloud, and then just plain old killing people. While you can only hold so many at once, there are bomb crafting stations everywhere, and getting crafting materials is so prolific that I had more, I, I had maxed out everything before, very, very early on, and that was just from looting guards every time I saw them. 
<laughs> it was kind of funny because I'm like, all right, blo blo I hadn't even done the crafting tutorial, and I'm like, all right, I'm full on goat's blood. What the heck does that do? You know. Point being, the options those allowed you were extensive and made the game a lot more fun, in my opinion, because, yes, I could just walk into this area and mow down all these guards in a, in a matter of, uh, like, 30 seconds, or... I could go in and uh, you know get to a nice spot, hide here for a moment, and then wait until you know that those three guys are clustered up and throw a shrapnel grenade, and kill all three of those guys at once and kill the last two guys. Or I could go out over here, th fling a distraction bomb over there, getting all of them to go over there and slip by without killing them all. Or I could throw a smoke bomb right here and literally just walk through them without them ever noticing I'm there. Or y y you get my point. That is the point. I do enjoy the bombing mechanic a great deal because of the additional options it gave you in combat, in gameplay, the optional ability to get through stuff. You never had to use bombs ever in the whole game. That's a lie. You have to do it in the tutorial, like, twice. But you get my point, right? Now, one other thing I have to uh, talk about as far as new stuff, gameplay-wise, they added, was, of course, the tower defense minigame. I don't have anything bad to say about the tower defense minigame, but I don't really have anything good to say about it either. At best, it was extremely easy, so it went by very quickly. Uh, now, i got to be honest with you. i got to have a confession to make. I came in on tower defenses, uh, what I consider to be basically when they really got started, which, in my frank opinion, was Warcraft 3. The tower defense maps, e Elemental TD, for God's sakes, or uh, was the other really big one at the time? I can't think of the name of it. It was like uh, three lanes, and you could have one, two, three, four, five, six players, and whatever. I got in at TDs pretty early on, and I actually really enjoyed them back in Warcraft 3. And then for some reason, tower defenses kind of exploded into like a whole new genre, and, and just everybody was making a tower defense. And part of the problem with that is most tower defense games are kind of not interesting, in my opinion. There's no tactics involved, there's no strategy involved, there's just plop stuff down, kill stuff, plop stuff down, kill stuff. That's the category this one sits in. Alright, if you crossbowmen, alright, use the gold or whatever uh, morale that they got, plop down, rifleman, 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 done. Watch the rest of the map play out. <sighs> I, I, I don't want to bash this game specifically for that. I, I mean, I kind of do. But it is a symptom of tower defense games in the last several years, for all honesty. Uh, in general, it's a problem. And this is no exception. This is the exact same problem it's, it's always been. It's just, yep, here's a tower defense. We threw it together. Yay. <sighs> Why? <laughs> and I have to be amused at the fact that one of the rewards for being really good at the tower defense fans or, or really training up your assassins is to not have to do them anymore. What? <laughs> you know, usually that's a bad sign when you see something like that. Now, that is... I, I, I want to segue that into something that I actually meant to say much earlier on. You'll notice uh, I, I said that in sort of bad terms, but not really. That's because I only did two tower defenses total. I still got the achievement because I mastered all my towers, and that apparently counts. But... I didn't actually bother doing more than the two. I only got the first one because it's required, it's the tor tutorial, and the second one happened because I was kind of intentionally pushing for it. I don't remember why at the time, I had a reason for it. Well, I wanted to see if it was any different than the tutorial. No, not really. You had a couple more options, I'll give it that, but I I'm getting off track. Things I genuinely did not like about this game. Now, there are two, and i got to remember what the other one is. Ah, yes. <laughs> I had, I'm sorry, it's kind of funny, there were two things that I'm like, ah, oh, these two things, I, and I always remembered the one, but I kept forgetting the two, and at some point in time, I actually, I, there's actually like a big giant line here just to put in the other complaint whenever I remember it, and when I finally don't, it's like, quick, quick, write it down. Um, number one, buying uh, property in Constantinople raises your uh, threat meter, your, your awareness meter, whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, the thing, uh, you, uh, uh, no notoriety, that's the word. Your notoriety meter. Let me say that again. Renovating and investing in shops in Constantinople raises your notoriety meter. 
Now, yes, I can see a logical reason behind that. And yes, it becomes utterly irrelevant once you get a decent cash flow. But early on, that was nothing but irritating. That was pure on irritating. And it got to the point where I would in intentionally, you know, invest, 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 invest. And then just wander around looking for a captain so I can just go, okay, it went back down, now I can go back to my life. It seemed kind of tacked on, and I'll admit that ultimately there don't seem to be a lot of ways to raise notoriety other than that in this game, so maybe that's what they were thinking. I just kind of disagree, personally. Given the political situation in this in the area with the, the Byzantines and the... You know what, there's like three factions there, and I don't feel like remembering what the other one's names are right now, because I'm kind of tired, to be honest with you. But... Ultimately, the the political situation with the, with the with everything going on, it it would have been very easy to have a notoriety mechanic where, uh, for example, let, you're thinking just outside of the box here a little bit. Why not have two meters? One with the Byzantines, you know, the Templars. One with the yellow guys. I can't think of their damn names. You know, let's even add a third one for the Janissaries, who are, let's be honest, their own political body. When it comes down to it, yes, they ultimately serve whoever happens to be in charge or whoever they happen to be being paid by. But you get the general point, and that way, you know actions you take against some of these people or are seen act taking actions or, you know, you get my general point, could raise the nor notoriety with these three. Not buying frickin' shops in the town. Ultimately, again, a minor complaint, but I do think that it is a complaint nonetheless. And the other one is the weird ex... I almost call it the God of War thing, but not, not clear not nearly as graphic. Anytime you finish up a combat, or if you're killing the last guy, it goes into this super slow-mo and it gets really close and you then you rip him, and then you slice him, and then you punch him, and then you poke him into your eyes. Yeah, it, it seemed so unnecessary to me in a game that, frankly, I don't really play for the violence. I know it's called Assassin's Creed, and I know killing is kind of what they do. But killing and violence are, are kind of separate categories, especially the way it's usually presented. Killing is usually... <laughs> and they're dead. This is just, oh, all right, and now we're doing this thing in Zoom. It seemed so tacked on, and... Frankly, more than once, it, it it got in my way. I was like, oh, I just want this to end so I can go to keep chasing after that guy because he's getting away now, and I'm not even sure which direction he is because the camera just decided to go, I'm over here now, because you get my general point. I don't want to em overemphasize the bad, but these two things I do consider to be genuinely bad things about Revelations. Also, the only two bad things I consider about generally <laughs> about Revelations. Ah, uh, was I done talking about... Uh, no, I wasn't. Let's get back to Constantinople. One of the things I really, really love about this city is it felt very alive. There are tons of voice acting tidbits that just kind of play. I mean, people talking about their sister or whether or not they're actually going to be able to make uh, payments on their, uh, their bills or whether or not they actually want an apple, feel like an apple today, or gosh, I wonder what's happening with Susie. Dozens upon dozens upon dozens upon dozens of voice acting. And occasionally, of course, they repeat, because duh, this is a game still. But it never once repeated to the point where I actually noticed unless I actively stood still in a spot for a little time. And I only did that to see if it would repeat like that, which it did. I'll give it that. That's in that. Nevertheless, I really like that. I really like the fact that there's always people going everywhere. This city feels very crowded, very busy, very alive. There's so many different sections of it. I mean, especially, you really get a shot of this when you go up and get the uh, the bird's eye views, you know, when you uh, sync up with a, with a region. The, the difference in architecture was very well done. It is very clearly that they did a great deal of homework on the design for Constantinople. You get to see the division between, you know, the north and the south, or indeed the west and the east, as, as it is more commonly considered between the between the cities and and the the variation you know some areas are clearly preserved and well designed and some areas are are dilapidated and are and are having problem and rotting and the places near the docks have you know water uh dissoluble uh difficulties going on with the wood you know and just don't, I, I couldn't even begin to detail all the many different specific details they put into just about everywhere, just about every building every stall every section of the area you know the stalls actually did have um <laughs> well, <laughs> okay, when you're a graphics designer and you have a stall, uh, when I say stall, uh, just a box, okay, a box with fruit in it. The easiest way to do it, assume this is the top of the box, the part that should be open, and it goes out like this. You do this box, and then you have this side of the box, which is in, in mesh, is physically just a flat line. You do a texture on this, and you do it, and, and if you're trying to, you know, trying to make this look good, you do a good texture, so unless you're within looking right at it or in decent range, it does look like the box. It's not until you're looking at it that you realize this is just a piece of paper with the picture of the button on it. What they did was they actually had the box 
which was open, and there was a separate mesh in there of, you know, here's an apple, here's an apple, here's an apple, and it's all one mesh, but, you know, apple, 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 apple. It actually made the impression of that, and I know that's a little thing, but that's kind of my point. They put so much attention to detail in all the little things to really make the city look fantastic. I loved Constantinople. Favorite location so far in the series, without question. Um... Hmm? Hmm. Right. Um, <laughs> sorry. Hang on a second here. Ah, oh, God, I have so many notes. I was really scribbling this time around. What do we got here? One of the things I do want to add as well... Okay. You'll forgive me for a moment. I'm trying to con gather my thoughts just a bit. I like the book searches that they added. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, you can go to certain viewing spots and look around and figure out where a book is thing. Now, these are not exactly hard. The reason I really liked them is because it, is, it was a, is a variant, only a small variant, but a variant on the usual jumping puzzle thing that has been, uh, well, a climbing puzzle is really what I should call this, which has been prevalent in the SS Assassin's Creed series since forever, you know, since the first one. And I liked the fact that, you know, you climb up, go around, climb up, go around. It, it was a different take on it, because then once you, once you get up, you're not, you're not just sinking with the area or whatever. You're actually specifically looking for, okay, what's that over there, and what's that over there. It was never hard, but it was interesting. Um, and one of the things I'm kind of leading up to here is an, an analogy, which I'll get to in just a second. And I was just looking at my notes. I also, as usual, love the jumping puzzles, the actual jumping puzzles. My favorite by far was the one going through the lighthouse. No, I'm thinking of the wrong one. The tower, where you fall in, you actually fall through the middle, and then you go through this massive section, and the 100% sink is due it in six minutes, which I actually managed. Woo. But no, I loved that. I loved just racing through there and grabbing the thing and, and the cinematic. It was it was very uncharted in its own way, and I really enjoyed the 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 more action paced jump uh, jumping puzzles that this one had. Most of the you know some of the previous ones have had a few action paced. Some of them had the, the, the very quiet you know just making your way through a temple kind of thing. Just about all of these were very you know. Wah! The only exception was like the lighthouse, which is the one I was forgetting about, which admittedly uh, <laughs> I have to laugh at. The idea that that place was so well made that it could do that, uh, I'll get to that point later. But nevertheless, was still very enjoyable, and was still, you know, all right, okay, gotta do this, and gotta do this, and jump, okay, and shung, shung, shung. Very much props to the jumping puzzles. They felt smoother, they felt uh, cleaner, they were a lot more obvious what you were supposed to do, and I like that, and they were a lot more reflex-intensive on several occasions. It's still not what I would call particularly hard. I don't think I actually failed uh, any of them. Uh, no, I failed one, which was following the guys on the boat, and that's uh, that was just my fault. I was a bit too twitchy, but you get the general point. Very enjoyable, uh, and it really gives you... One of the things I've talked about before with regards to the parkour element of the Assassin's Creed series is that sense of constant flow, and uh, one of the things I liked about this jumping puzzle is that exact same method. It made it feel like even... Uh, I've talked about this before, you know, the controls and how you're doing this thing. It, w it was smoothed out the process, so you don't have to have to hit hop, pop, 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 top, pop, pop. Now, some may call that a bad thing, and I can I can see the argument for that. The reason I call that a good thing is doing this is, by its nature, kind of flow-breaking. Not rhythm-breaking, because this is rhythm, but flow is... You follow me? Rhythm would be more like this. Assassin's Creed has always been much better at flow. It has been very... And so all these jumping puzzles with the pace and with the, the speed that you were going through them, you all you have to do is hold down like three or four keys and, and use the right ones in the right order, but you're always holding them down. It's always that flow rather than mashing the keys. You understand where I'm going with this, and I think that worked very well in this case. Um, I think that's about uh, enough. Everything I've been talking about, I haven't talked about a few things. I'm going to leave those for my post-spoiler section. But everything I've been talking about has been building up to this one analogy, okay? Let's say you happen to really like a type of food. Um, steaks. Okay, let's use that. That's fairly universal. You really like steak, okay? Now, realistically speaking, if you ate steak every day, that might be okay. But if you ate steak every uh, three times a day, every meal, at that point, you're probably going to get a little bit... If you're not going to get sick of it, which is possible you might not, you will assuredly get to the point where you no longer appreciate it as much. Because that's human nature. We are, by our nature, adaptive. Pardon me, I really need some a drink here. Oh, goodness. Oh, that burns.
It's just water. It's just my throat. Oh. We are by our nature adaptive, which means when we are subjected to the same stimulus over and over and over, we tend to com become accepting of it and think of it as the norm. Uh, so if you're just eating steak all the damn time, it's going to lose its luster. Let's say you're having steak and you also have the option of having dessert, you know, a nice uh, pastry or something. And you also have some fruit, and you also have some vegetables. When you vary it up like that, you have a greater chance of in guaranteeing that you're not going to get bored. Now, even then, you have to do something in a slightly different pattern. For example, if you had fruit, vegetables, meat, dessert, fruit, vegetables, meat, dessert, every single day, you're still going to have the same problem, just a little bit more long-term. It'll be stretched out more, right? But if you vary it up, the, it'll be like, ah, fruit, awesome, oh, today, meat, awesome, oh, more fruit, oh, now veggies, you know, oh, and some dessert, you know, something like that. Uh, I know this is a strange analogy. Let me, let me bring this back to what I'm actually talking about, and that is gameplay uh, options, choices, that kind of thing. I, I will talk about more of these in just a moment. I'll actually get to that pretty much next, as soon as I hit my spoiler section. But there was enough, th all the activities you could do in Assassin's Creed Revelations, the jumping puzzles, the climbing puzzles, the book puzzles, which I listed separately, the whole temp uh, t taking down the Templar areas and uh, stuff like that, the, uh, the the renovation thing, the running around getting the Animus pieces, I, I feel like I'm missing some. There was enough activities which were different enough that as long as you varied it around, it, it, like I did, for example, it never got boring. It never got old. It never got used. I've never got used to it. It was like, yeah, and this, and then this, and then I get to go do this, and I didn't quite do it on purpose, if that makes any sense. It was just kind of whatever happened to be in the region of where I was, which I think speaks to the well-designed nature of the city. Again, I'm still kind of on Constantinople here, because any given section, any given district of the city, had enough activities within that area to to basically run the gamut, and then you could roam and go over here, and now there's different activities, and some of them are going to be the same type of thing, but, you know, you now you ha you don't have to do the thing you just did. You can do the third thing you just did, or the eighth thing you just did, or whatever. You understand my logic here, right? Hopefully you do, anyways. Um, hmm. Anything else I can talk about before I get to spoilers? I think that's it. Let's get into the spoiler section. Tension, this is the point of no return. I am your spoiler. No, okay. Let's talk about these Desmond sections. As I said in brief, I like the fact that Desmond finally is a character. I also have said before, uh, and, and I, I think I said before, I might not have actually said this, I do genuinely think that the... Uh, the killing of Lucy Stillman and the revelation of her being a uh, triple agent was, in fact, kind of added in to make this happen. I don't think that was planned from the beginning, but I think it's at least a plausible enough thing, and I, I, I'm going willing to go with it, is what I'm saying here, because it got us to this point. What they wanted... Uh, the f when you look at something that is created in a serial... That is a true uh, direct serial. I talked about this way back when I started thinking you know, the difference between all the, the types of stories. A direct serial has one huge risk, and that is real life. Okay, let me explain a little bit. Actors sometimes don't want to keep doing the same roles. Sometimes the produ production staff changes. Sometimes one of the guys who is one of your head writers leaves or is fired. Sometimes the budget can't really support what you want to do. Some, you know, There are problems upon problems upon problems. It is hard to remain static when you're doing a direct serial like that. Okay. Th th I know that sounds kind of like a dub, but that is something that is, that is always the, the greatest risk and one of the reasons I think so very few video game direct serials have ever existed. In fact, I can only think of like three Oh, excuse me, three off the top of my head, counting this one. So, it is my opinion that after Patrick What's-His-Face left, I could be getting the name wrong, and after they lost a bit of direction, several production staff, and a few changes behind the scenes, they basically wanted to get to the point where Revelations was, to get to the Revelations story. The new team wanted to get here, but they were left with the, with the old path, which was kind of going off in this direction, and so they had to basically do this. And in this case, they th they sat down and thought of their options, and they decided to do it pretty bluntly and pretty immediately. Okay, we need him to get into the Animus again for in order to see this thing. Now, we don't have any big things for him to find, because him finding the key is going to be the plot of Assassin's Creed 3. We already know that, because we're already working on it. And he's already found where the temple is, so what do we have this be about? And they realized 
that rather than have him actually looking for anything, why not have him look for himself? A, again, this brings Desmond Miles in, in as a character, and B, it does make a degree of sense. It is a plot device. It is a, is, it is a bit of a cliche, but I'm willing to go with it, so they decided, okay, let's have him murder someone close to him. Now, uh, and, and then someone out there was, was immediately like, you know, okay, why? Why does he do this? And they're like, well... Let's think about that. And they decided to go ahead and make Lucy a triple agent. Okay. And I have to admit, in hindsight, her reasoning makes sense and really is indicative of the message of the Assassin's Creed series as a whole, which is, in short, the mundanity of everyday life and what it does to people. Lucy was a victim of that. Lucy was a victim of thinking things in a small term. In... in, in, in with a small scale, you understand? She was thinking about tomorrow, not the next 30 years or the next thousand. Now, I say that because this is a fictional setting. This is a setting where things are actually happening, where there is a long-term, millennia-long war that has been going on, and there are bigger problems like the, the solar flare issue, which is going to be coming in. So, in my opinion, you can't, uh, you can't be blamed for having that small view, even though you are technically wrong in having it. Especially because the system is specifically designed to keep you within that box, within this little bubble. So, in a nutshell, Lucy Stillman was just another human being, if you follow me. And so she decided, okay, I'm going to think about tomorrow, rather than ten years from now. And that made a degree of sense to me. And it also makes sense because the, uh, the firsts have already shown a, pro a proficiency with knowing and seeing the future. And so they would, of course, know Lucy was a triple agent. And given the fact that he was about to, lay, uh, to grab the apple and, and make his way towards the temple, they couldn't let Lucy have that. So, done. Problem done. My point here is that while it was a clear jolt and it was clearly designed to, like I des described earlier, I still give them credit for it because the pieces do make sense. They do actually fit together. There's a bit of jury rigging, but at least they managed it. Now, that being said, I do really like the revelations of Desmond's past life, everything that he had gone through, everything he went through. Desmond, by contrast, was not a victim of the box mentality. He was not a victim of the, the mundanity. He was a victim of lack of knowledge, lack of understanding, uh, a lack of humanity in its own way, because his father never actually took care of him in the way he should. If you're going to train someone and, and build someone up in such a severe manner as assassin's training is implied to be, human beings, especially without anything else to go off of, need some kind of reason. Why am I doing this? Why am I still doing this? Why am I still doing this? It makes perfect sense to me that Desmond was just like, I'm done, bye. It really does. I'm surprised there aren't more. Then again, it is implied that actually uh, there are several assassins who have the exact same basic response. I'm done, bye. And that I've placed flame squarely on his father's uh, shoulders. That is pure on his fault, in my opinion. But I did like the fact that even when he went off and lived his pretend life in the city and, and dealt with all the little small issues, girls and bartending and, you know, pay, pay, paychecks and bills, all those little things, he still got across the impression, that the actor and the wording he used, uh, still got across the point that he wasn't actually buying into it. He wasn't actually in the box. He was just kind of going along with it because it was different, because it wasn't what he had started with. He was doing the childhood rebellion thing that all children do at some point or another, or indeed more than once. And I like that. I like that presentation of it. Again, it made Desmond Miles a person, a character, as opposed to just a viewpoint, which he'd basically been up to this point. And the final se sequence is there when he got kidnapped by Abstergo, and they're like, you're going to do this for us. And he realized, uh, he has this beautiful line, at that moment I wanted all that training back. At that moment I wanted it all right there because I was afraid. Really narrows it down because th that moment of revelation is almost goosebump in, in, in inducing. You know, just, oh my god, they were right all along, that kind of a thing. That's, that's a horrifying thought in more ways than one. And I'm sure most of us would have the same basic reaction to d that Desmond did in that circumstance. And I also loved that sequence, by the way, actually going through what was effectively the the cubicle area of Abstergo, as as everything is becoming more and more coherent and actually looking like pe like locations rather than data. Loved that. 
I mentioned uh, John Delancey's excellent performance, and I wanted to leave it. As we know, due to the sequence of events, John Delancey, uh, mostly thanks to Clay, uh, a.k.a. Subject 16, is well aware of the fact that Lucy Stillman was a triple agent, uh, had double... had uh, whatever. She was with the Templars. So there's this wonderful audio sequence where he's talking with Sean, and they're talking about burying Lucy and all that thing, and John Delancey is perfectly subtle in her performance because he sa- because you can tell he's trying to sound like he's... <laughs> He's not upset about it. She was his enemy, and she has caused him and his son and his friend, or his agent, or whatever you want to call it, pain more than once. So he is not sad that she's gone. Oh, well. But he can't just say, yep, Lucy's dead, that's all good. So he tries to cover it by sounding like he's being too professional to let on what he's really feeling. And thus the implication there is that what he's trying to be too professional to, sh- to not show the fact that he's actually heard about it, as opposed to the fact that he's being too professional in order to hide the fact that he doesn't give a damn because he's glad she's dead. Or whatever. I could be reading too much into it, but you get the important point there. And frankly, I don't think I'm reading too much into it. I know John Delancey's voice acting. He knows how to do that kind of subtlety. And I... And you could hear it. Very well done. Um... Uh, is there anything else I wanted to double tap on here? Yes, yes. The, uh... Uh, hang on, where is it? During this, uh, you can recruit several static characters, all of which have their own unique missions to it. This is part of that whole different foods thing I mentioned earlier. You know, each one of those missions is different. The brawl, or the pickpocketing one, or the race. Awesome. Definitely with it. And each one of those people has their own little missions after they have become assassins, once they hit level 10, and once they hit level 15, in order to master them. And what I loved most about those was those weren't about Ezio. Uh, at all, really. While Ezio was obviously the mentor when we think of... Well, okay, that's a bad example. I was about to say Karate Kid, but that is a bad example because most people think of the mentor of that film. The point being, he was the mentor but not the main character of those particular stories. He was not the one who we were really focusing on. We were focusing on them, and I liked the fact that it, we got to see these windows of other people with actual personality. Uh, the woman who accidentally assassinates the wrong target and, and experiences regret about this, you know, is a good example of that. The guy who was disgusted by the, the torturer, you know, all of these things. Very well done. Furthermore, I like it especially because, as I will talk about in much more length in a bit here, there's always been a difference between Altair's approach and Ezio's approach. Now, this has been in every single possible way. One of the ways is the deathbed scenes. Ezio usually kills them. Sometimes they have a line. It's usually one sentence. And then he, you know, Requia Scott and Pace. Boom. Done. Altair has conversations. Long conversations. It's awesome. But that's Altair, as opposed to Ezio. The two have always been stylish. Over here, with the recruits, we have a third version, which is kind of in between the two. The the people they kill explain why it is that they had done what they'd done. And I like the fact that not all of them... that there was some variation there. There was the woman who believed that, you know, she joined the Templars because people aren't deserving of the protection you're giving them. They are just sheep, and we need to, you know, they're here to be used. And then there was the guy who was like, you know, I will live my life proud because I stood up and I was willing to stand up for what I believe in. And then there were like two or three people who joined them because they were in the box, because they were thinking small term. Now, I'm not going to say they were wrong. I will never do that, not in this case. But the point is, they both, they mentioned that the political situation, the, the, the social situation, that what happened with their families, what happened to their friends, the Ottoman juggernaut that came in and crushed so much land. I mean, this happened right at the uh, tail end, I guess. The Ottoman Empire was still around, but the Ottoman Empire had done this expansion from hell just before this period of time. And so, well, not just before, but you get the point, prior to this period of time. And... Several of them were dis- disheartened, distraught over the fact that the Assassin Order had done nothing about the fact that the Ottoman juggernaut had gone... <laughs> and I really liked that. It gave them actual character motivations. Even though we only see, like, have, like, five lines from these characters, it still gave them character windows. And fr- through the so we get the windows of the Assassins, uh, your, your uh, children, your students that you raise up, and then we get windows of... Their targets through all these things. Brilliantly done. I also... Oh, goodness. I also really liked uh, Yusuf. He struck me very much as uh, an intentional counterpoint to Ezio. Ezio at this point is old and seasoned and 
peppered, and you, you get my point. He has reached a point where he is now who he is. He has gained a degree of wisdom and understanding. And Yusuf is this brash youth, just like Ezio used to be. And he's just like, ah, yeah, it's rock, yeah, you know. He get that, got that across in all of his tonality, and you could tell that Ezio could see that and actually enjoyed seeing someone who was, you know, himself as he was younger now. And the two got along famously, and I think at no part uh, as a result of that. I also get the feeling that in the in, initially I thought Yusuf was going to either betray you or was actually testing you. I think, now, having seen the whole thing and having directly experienced it again, it is my opinion that Yusuf was, in fact, pro probing him, you know, being the rebellious, loof, rebellious youth, uh, you know, just being like, ah, oh, yeah, what are you going to do about it? And Ezio just kind of goes right along with it because he's been there and done that, and in so doing, he gains Yusuf's respect very quickly, I might add. And then the two basically become, oh, okay, yes, we're definitely on the same page very quickly. I thought that worked great, and the two, I thought, had very good chemistry together. One of the things I also liked is that both of them had a genuine propensity for destruction. They weren't very quiet or subtle types. And I, I shouldn't say I like that beca because, you know, ah, it's just explosions, Michael Bay. No, what I mean is that I liked the fact that they were on the same page res with regards to that, and that both of them at least stuck to their strengths rather than trying to mm, ape Altair style, for example. Um, excuse me. Uh, let's see, what's my next point here? I really like the fact that a lot of this uh, entire game really emphasizes Ezio in his twilight years. You can tell that he is just plain tired of all of this. When he went to Mayasov, shoot, I sound like I think the name of it, the, the fortress area, he wasn't really going there for a fight. He was going there just to check some things out. And then it turned into a fight, and you could just feel this... Uh, from him, you know, oh god, I gotta do all this again. And that whole initial section of the game, when when he is running through there and he's injured and, he, and he's dealing with all this stuff, really emphasizes the point that he doesn't really want to do this anymore. And that only gets stronger as he goes on, as he meets, meets Sophia and uh, starts talking with her and his interactions with Yusuf, who still has the youth and the, the vigor. You know, you get you just more and more in his tone and his presentation, you get across the point that he really does not want to do this anymore. He says it all is summarized perfectly when he's talking with Sophia pretty much right at the end, when she says, you know, how, you know, when did you join? He says, I don't remember that choice. This life came to me. And his bitterness, as he says that, is so profound. He has done so much over his three decades Imagine that for a moment. Thirty years spent in fighting that invisible war. Try and try and picture that, if you may, because that's kind of soul-crushing. And it really speaks to his character that he kept going at all, and indeed actually had a life afterwards. That's astonishing, and I want to stress that I'm actually very glad that he did get to have a life afterwards. After all, Alt Altair was not as lucky. Was he? Sorry. I just... It's it, the whole presentation of that and and everything it was doing was very much you know oh, I I just want to be done with this I want to hand the mantle off I want to pass on I want to do my one last thing and then I'm done and it all is it all comes to a head right at the end when there's the apple and he goes to reach for it and then he says no I've seen enough for one lifetime and he th that one action speaks volumes now I know imagine for a moment if you were there if you had the apple right before you, and you knew what it could do. The ability to not pick that up is something that I don't think most of us could could say we would do, even after being through his life, even after having experienced what he experienced. The fact that he was willing to do that truly shows through action, without question, that he was done. He didn't want this life anymore. He wanted to go and have his quiet little f life with his fam family, I'd never deal with this again. And I liked the way they emphasized that uh, many times, but most especially right there towards the end. Very well done. And it was a perfect cap to Ezio's story. I think Ezio had a, a good ending to the story. Uh, well done ending. Of course, Altair also had a well done ending to his story, but I could not possibly call that good because holy crap! But I gotta be honest, in this whole game, there was one scene that truly gave me goosebumps, that just, just hit me. Woom! Allow me to elaborate, if I may. Throughout the game, uh, actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna diverge for just a second to talk about something else I like. 
we get a hint of something that may or may not have been intentional. I like to think it is, because this game, these games in general certainly know how to do subtlety. The Animus has its own little appearance thing, right? It's got the, the gray and the kind of slate blue thing with black lines. Whenever Ezio enters one of Altair's memory things, it's completely different. It's got the gold patterns, and it's not the line grid thing. Instead, it's actually a, a pattern, like it was a city or a temple or something like that. Same general concept, but completely different execution. Now, the obvious point here is that I believe that Ezio really was effectively entering an animus of Altair's memories. It's just, in his case, he was entering a specific... It, it was a much more advanced animus. It was just this one little disk, and this one little disk was able to do everything that that entire table was able to do with its DNA sequencing and coding and whatnot. In other words, the technology of the of the first was that much superior, and Altair was able to use that way back then, literally millennia before they invented, I guess a millennia, before they invented, um... Actually, I guess it's not one, right, quite a millennia. Centuries before they invent, Abstergo invented the chair, the animus. And... I really liked the idea that Ezio, in doing that, in my opinion, probably finally got a, at least an idea of who, and how Desmond was viewing his stuff. I could be wrong about that, but the point is I liked the variation in the two. I especially liked that because of what I'm getting into here. Altair's sequences were pure gold. I have often said that gameplay should... all aspects of gameplay should be a storytelling tool. It should be fun in its own right. Duh. And gameplay and story integration is a big deal, but anything you do in gameplay should be a tool. Very first mission, what is it? You're as Altier. If you get capt if you get detected, it's over. You don't have, now, at this point in time, you've been playing as Ezio for a while, and you've got the hook blade, and you've got the assassins you can call, and you've got the... the, the arrow thing, or the, what's your fake thing is, you've got the gun, you've got the poison thing, you've got your bombs, all of that is gone. All you have is you and your damn hook blades, or your regular blades, you know what I mean. Actually, regular blade, I'm sorry. This is what you have. This is it. And you have to not be detected and get through a place with a time limit. You have to get there so long. That is Altair in a nutshell. He didn't have any of the gadgets, he didn't have any of the backing, and he didn't have any of the fighting. And yet he still managed to, to accomplish that, something Ezio would have had to have all his tools to do so, like that. That's Altair in a nutshell. And of course, Altair then kills the guy, and lo and behold, has his own little uh, deathbed sequence, just like in his particular idiom, you know, the long one. He does this again later with uh, Abbas, or whatever his name was, the guy I hated. And through each of Altair's sequences, Th that 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 just keeps going. That gameplay of each sequence actually varies, uh, sometimes significantly, and each time it is done very much on purpose to get across the point. For example, one of them, you can't actually attack or do much of anything. All you can do is walk around or signal your guys if you want to, and occasionally uh, counterattack to disarm. Because you're an old man, you don't fight anymore. You're you can't even run. You you can't parkour at all. You can't run. All you can do is kind of hobble forward. That sequence was nothing sh short of pure gold, because as you're doing this, all the assassins, like 90% of the assassins around you are fighting for you and fighting in favor of you, and as you keep going, more and more see you and are like, yes! No apple, no rallying cry, no, follow me, lend me your ears! His mere presence had so much potential, so much impact, so much charisma, so much presence, that everyone was just like, Yes, Mentor, and they all followed Altair just like that. It was beautiful. And when you finally get there, and you talk to Abbas, and you're like, Yes, I have seen the future. Let me show you. And then you shoot him with the gun. Now, I want to stress, this was way, way, way long ago. A gun, back then, is insanity. And yet, that's the kind of the point, is that he had advanced in his knowledge and in his own technological prowess just that much. And then he had his beautiful deathbed sequence with Avis, blah, 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 blah. You get the point. Every single one of them was, was pure gold. Every single one of them. But none of them more so than the very last one. Again, I'm going to paint this picture. I'm finally getting back to this point. Ezio enters the area, walks up. You can't actually not. He will automatically, even if you try to point elsewhere, walk up, light the torch, second torch, third torch, walks into the library, 
Now, you've been trying to get to this library literally for the entire game. This has been the point since the game started. You you went to this Maesea for whatever place in order to get to this library, and you found out they were trying to get into the library, and you spent the entire game running around like a mad hellion trying to stop the Templars from getting into the library and get in yourself. And you get in, and there are no books. And it's visible. It's obvious. All the bookshelves are empty. There is nothing there except a a skeleton in his robes on a chair. Altair himself. And you lean down and you're like, oh my goodness. And he, and, he, and the, the reverence in Ezio's tone as he says, Requies gotten pace, my brother, was beautiful. And then he takes the last memory disc, the last mini animus disc, and sees Altair's last moments as he embraces his son and begs his son to live and live well and goes back in. And as he goes back, he goes the exact same thing. You're actually playing, again, uh, one of the things I think is very important in video games, because it is interactive medium, is to make the player do things. Even if they can't, don't actually have a choice in the matter, making the player do it makes the impact all the more. Metal Gear Solid comes to mind here. Metal Gear Solid 3, I'm sorry, comes to mind here immediately. You have to pull the trigger in that last scene. You have, you're the one who has to do it, otherwise it'll just sit there forever. Making the player do that made it have all the more impact. And so you have to move forward and douse those three torches one by one that you just lit. And he puts down the apple. And then the quest, you know, your little mission thing pops up, your objective, and it says, sit and have a rest for a while. And as soon as I saw that, I actually started tearing up a bit. I was just like, oh, God. Because I knew exactly what was happening, what I was seeing, the, the impact of it. And then he goes, and he barely sits down, and there's this beautiful panning shot of him sitting down and finally relaxing, and he lo- kind of just tilts his head just a little bit, and the camera finishes coming around, and it's now the present. And Altair is still there in the exact same pose, long since dead. And Ezio is just staring at it, just kind of, wow. And that goosebumps, holy crap, that was a brilliant scene. And then he goes and he starts talking directly to Desmond, which I thought was awesome. Uh, When I say directly, obviously I don't believe he had any real acknowledgement of Desmond per se. I could be wrong. The way it's presented, it could be either way. It is also very possible, given the experience he's been having with the first and his... uh, actions with Altair's Animus's things, they'd had an idea of what was going on. So he may have actually been aware of Desmond's presence to some extent or another. Regardless, he knew Desmond could hear him, and he started talking to him directly and talking about all that's happened, and maybe you will be the one to ask these questions. Maybe all of this suffering will be worth something. And then we get the revelation scene, which I'm going to talk about in brief. Pardon me, my throat is really giving me issues. During the revelation scene, we learn from Jupiter, I believe, that a few key crucial facts. Up until now, we have been aware that something horrible is going to happen December 21st, 2012. Now, coincidentally, that is the launch date for that uh, satellite that Abstergo was going to toss out with the eye on it, or with the apple on it, in order to take over the world, you know, mind control the whole planet. So there's been this implication for for basically the entire series that that's the problem, that they're the problem. What I liked best about this scene was the fact that they weren't, if that makes any sense. I like the fact that the Templar and Assassin War was a distraction, ultimately. I like the fact that it was two people squabbling over genuine genuine differences of philosophy and mindset, while a real threat, that is, threat to both of them, looms that basically no one's been aware of. I like that that use of storytelling, as long as you don't overdo it. And the realization that the Templars were not the real threat, but this flare thing that's going to happen up again, that was the real threat. I actually really liked that. And again, we get to this whole, I'm, I'm actually saving the world instead of fighting this invisible war thing, excuse me, thing. You know, I really enjoyed that. A couple other things we find out. Uh, first of all, the firsts were not terrestrial. They had uh, the ability to travel throughout the entire solar system and possibly beyond. Very interesting. Uh, probably just limited to the solar system, which would simply mean that they don't have uh, faster than light travel, which is fine. That is actually quite reasonable, all things considered makes a lot of sense to me, in my opinion, and really helps emphasize that Earth 
and what's left on Earth really is the last bastion of him. You know, they did go through a, a cataclysm, and they were wiped out, and this is all that's left. I, I kind of like the way that was presented. I also am very impressed that they actually showed a full 3D s cinematic rendering of the world getting crushed and showing just how horrific the devastation really is, because it really puts it point blank just how bad things are going to be if you don't save them all, if you don't stop this. Um, and I think that's everything we learn about that particular sequence. So, nevertheless, awesomeness. One of the things I like best about this, a lot of people I know, myself included, figured out that Q, John Delancey, was playing uh, Desmond's father before the revelation. But I like the way they handle it. It's not like, I am your father. No, it's just... Son, are you okay? And he just slips that word in so casually, just like part of normal conversation. And that, and he only says it once. That one little thing right at the end there. I like that. I like the way they did that. Uh, now, I think I'm through most of the things I wanted to talk about. I'm sorry, I'm just glancing over my notes here. There is one other big thing I want to talk about, and it has to do with the series as a whole. And I've been waiting on it till the end here, till the very end of Revelations, which is the last Assassin's Creed I'm going to be doing for the foreseeable future. I probably will do three at some point, just, you know. I do believe I am there. So, let's talk about something that a lot of you are going to think is trivial, uh, I, I feel, and I think it is incredibly important. I'm going to say it in a nutshell, and then I'm going to try and explain. Assassin's Creed is a fantasy game, not a science fiction game. Now, let me fix my hair, Whee. and let me try and explain. Assassin's Creed has always had an incredibly soft approach to science. I've already talked about this. It is so threadbare in its explanation of the science that it employs that it's pathetic. And a lot of the things we accept, we just accept because they're more advanced. You know, uh, Clark's, uh, or is it Clark's Law? I think it's Clark's Law. You know, any sufficiently advanced technology in indistinguishable blah, 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 blah. But... And while that is true in many ways, the things they do are ridiculous in many cases and incredibly uh, well-designed, well-detailed. The firsts themselves and their ability to either A, look into the future, or B, are actually still around in the future is, is, is nothing short of astonishing, and the, the sheer precision with which they can wield it is, is insane. The abilities of the apples, which have effectively no user interface whatsoever, are just boong, use, boong, use, and the things you can do with that, for example, and all of the various things, uh, for example, Borgia and the thing he used with the sta stave. Um, the way the animus works in, to begin with, uh, while I'm on the subject, the way the sun is going to nuke the planet, um without actually destroying it. I could I could actually list many, many, many things. And several of these can be argued to be scientifically possible. But in my opinion, it is better presented as fantasy. As pure on, you know, this is a fantasy game. This is not trying to adhere to any rules other than its own. Because it doesn't. Assassin's Creed does not adhere to any rules other than its own. It may occasionally segue into one or, or look like it does, but ultimately the overall point is it's keeping true to itself, being self-consistent, not consistent to any t term of reality. Okay? Now, I could make several points about this, but there's one huge one that I want to make, and this is something that I have felt since Assassin's Creed 2, personally. I have always felt that the bloodline of the hybrids between the first and the uh, humans has been more of a, forgive me, a mystical thing than a scientific thing. And it has been my opinion for a long time that the reason why Altair, and the reason why Ezio, and the reason why Desmond can do all these physical feats that, in all honesty, are extremely impressive. If you look at it from a real-world perspective, from a scientific perspective, the things they're doing are ludicrous in their capacity. It's it They are literally superhuman. And it's kind of ele it basically is kind of hand waved away as you know their part first and so they are kind of superhuman but that's kind of my point that's not a scientific point that is a fantasy point that is mysticism that has you know the force or you know magic or whatever behind it something that isn't explained tangible or understandable and never in tries to be and that's also important they never really try to explain it away 
Never is that more apparent than in Revelations. I know a lot of people have a problem with the fact that Ezio, an old man, is doing these feats that would make a, a completely fit 18-year-old here in the real life think, Damn! I, I'm never going to do that! And one of the main reasons I think that is possible is because Ezio is superhuman. Because Altair was superhuman. Because these people were capable of doing these incredible feats of, of, of physical strength. Because they weren't human. They were stronger. They were superhuman. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I sound like I'm, I'm looping myself, and it's because I am. I don't know how better to make this point. The mere fact that Ezio could do so much and so hard... And then he even came out the other side and was like, all right, I'm fine, and then had more of a life after that point. Uh, is, duh. Nowhere in the, and now, again, I, this is a thought I've had since Assassin's Creed 2. This is not new. But I wanted to mention it here because Ezio, old Ezio here, really emphasizes the point more than anything else. Old Ezio keeps up with brand new young assassins and bests them at every turn fights down dozens upon dozens of guards, takes out a whole f a f a small little fleet, a squadron, really, in the thing, you know, I, I can't even begin to list. He does so much stuff throughout this game. Because he's superhuman, because he is not scientific, because he's not a guy, because he is literally an augment, as I like to call them, uh, that general classification of fictional individual. He is an augment. And... Yeah, I'm with that. And it is this is why I emphasize that I think it is important to dis distinguish between the science fiction and the fantasy element. Because when you look at this series as a fantasy series, it, in my opinion, it makes so much more sense. All of it makes so much more sense. After all, fantasy is not necessarily defined by a lack of technology. It is simply defined as not bothering to be realistic. Self-believable, maybe, but not realistic. And I don't think that describes Assassin's Creed in a nutshell. Now, I hope I've gotten across some of my enthusiasm. I had a ball playing this game. Granted, I only had a few... You know, I had trouble playing it because real-life things were getting in the way. But every time I got to Sandown, it was like, Yes! All right, go! Do do more stuff! And then do this! And oh my god! Oh. And I love the fact that, you know, okay, here's... Uh, the 100% sinks. I'm like, okay, do I want to go through this area and do this? Oh, that sounds like a pain. I don't feel like doing... Ooh, don't get caught through the whole section. I like that. Let's do that. Sneak, sneak, sneak. You know, I really had a lot of fun. And I really enjoyed myself. And I know some of you out there are going to take some uh, umbrage to that. And I understand. All I ask is you to be civil about your discourse. Because, in my opinion, this is a great game. But my opinion is not necessarily right. After all... Uh, you know, what else is there other than uh, who we are and what we are and what we do? Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to very badly rest my throat. So I will talk to you guys later. Chukoo.